So in this video, we're going to look at Mark Antony's Friends, Romans, Countrymen scene from Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Let's sally forth and get stuck in, shall we? Of all of Shakespeare's speeches, possibly none has the more famous opening line. I think almost everyone knows it. Friends, Romans, countrymen. Lend me your ears. And this is Mark Antony beginning his speech at Caesar's funeral. And the way I've just delivered that is in the classic oratorical style. You know, really, blah, whereas there are obviously a lot of different ways of delivering this. And I might mention some of them later on in this video. Now, you might be looking at this because you want to answer it, be ready for an exam, you're preparing for exams. Um, or it's because you want to sort of get into Shakespeare, maybe you like acting, uh, belong to an acting society, and so you want to get familiar with what's being said. Can I just say, I do this with all my videos, the way to really get the most out of Shakespeare is to understand what he's saying, or his characters are saying, and appreciate the language used. If you can do that, you can pretty much do everything else. Everything else falls into place. It comes down to understanding him, of course, something in my eye there. So don't look for, tell me what's right for my exams. If you can appreciate what's being said and understand it, you'll be ready to answer any question on it. Okay, so form an opinion as you listen along to this. A bit of background. Act three, scene two, we're starting at approximately line 74. And what's just happened, Caesar's been murdered by a group of conspirators in the Roman Senate. Brutus is one of them, and Brutus was called Caesar's angel, so he was meant to be on Caesar's side, but Brutus feels that Caesar was a threat to the Republic. The others are merely envious of Caesar. That's why they want him gone. But Brutus has got rid of or killed Caesar with them because he wants to defend the Republic. And he's gone to the funeral of Caesar, and he's spoken and said, explained to the plebeians, that's the common citizens of Rome, that the reason we had to kill Caesar was because he wanted to do away with the Roman Republic and install himself as monarch, as king, as emperor. A uh, permanent dictator would have been the title um, back in Roman days. And that was something anathema to the Romans. And so they think, oh, how wonderful of Brutus to kill Caesar, even though he loved him, for the sake of Rome. Now, Brutus leaves at this point and is given permission for Mark Antony, who also loved Caesar and was not involved in the plot to kill him. Brutus has given Mark Antony permission to speak as long as he doesn't say anything negative about the conspirators. And that's where we are. So how is Mark Antony going to turn the crowd from praising Brutus and the other senators to actually loving Julius Caesar and then supporting Mark Antony to get vengeance for him. I'm really struggling with this eye. <laughs> Let's start. He ascends the platform. There's probably quite a lot of noise amongst all of the plebeians calling him. So he calls, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The, off, uh, the good is oft interred with their bones. Okay, let's take this now. Beautiful, beautiful three-stroke rhythm at the beginning of friends, Romans, countrymen. It's a beautiful lyricism which attracts the ear. But also, of course, he's calling for attention. Okay? He's trying to get their attention, but also he's saying that we're fellow Romans, we are friends, we are countrymen. So he's joining himself as a patriot. Brutus, remember, is already classed as a patriot because he killed Caesar for Rome. Here goes Antony, friends, Romans, country, lend me your ears. In other words, give attention to me, please. And that's important because they're all on Brutus's side by now. They think Brutus is noble and they're worried that Mark Antony is going to say something against Brutus. So he's saying, just lend me your ears. And then he says, I come to bury Caesar, not praise him. Remember, the crowd would know that Mark Antony was beloved 
of Julius Caesar and loved Caesar back in return. So they may think he's here to try and praise Caesar. And they've just learned from Brutus that Caesar's very ambitious and it's a good thing that he's dead. So Mark Antony sidesteps it. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Okay, so he's, he's allowing the crowd to listen to him now. And then what did he say? The evil men do lives after them. So they've just heard that Caesar was bad. And he's saying, well, look, the, the evil that men do, he's almost admitting Caesar did evil. And it lives after them, doesn't it? And then he mentions that the good is often turned with their bones. So, oh, Caesar has done bad things and anything good you can forget. It's in, in the coffin. Now that's what he says, but it's already a double entendre. It's got such a great double meaning. Because let's list this again. The evil that men do lives after them. Now, Caesar has died. And there's a hint here that evil lives on after Caesar. And where the stress comes in is evil, men, lives. Now, already Mark Antony is stressing that evil men live despite the fact that Caesar is dead. He's subtly making reference to the senators who killed Caesar. And then he says, the good is often interred with the bones. Okay, so we all want good. Who is interred at the moment? Interred means to be um, entombed under earth or put inside a coffin or a sarcophagus. Who at the moment is interred right there in front of them? Caesar. And what's Mark Antony just said? The good is interred with the bones. So on the one hand, he could say, I'm saying that, yes, the bad things Caesar did live on after him and the good that he did do, well, that's gone now. But on the flip side of the coin, he's actually saying evil lives on now that Caesar is gone and the good is in the coffin with him. Do you see what he's done? Very clever bit of... Um, oration. Then he says, so let it be with Caesar. So he's saying, so let, you know, everything happen with Caesar. So may all the, the good that Caesar did pass away with him. But he may be hinting, so may it be with Caesar that now he's gone, so may it be. You deserve to bring upon yourself the evil men who live as they're going to try and rule over you. Now, watch this. We're we're coming to some exquisite use of language now to undermine Brutus' accusation that Caesar was ambitious. And um, the oratorical device you're going to hear is, it's got the name um, Reposia, which basically means to say the same thing, but slightly changing the stress and meaning of the words, even though the words are the same. So are you ready for this? You will hear a phrase throughout. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Okay. Brutus has just left, and they, they've all been won over by his speech. So what does Antony say? The noble Brutus. Oh, they can all agree with that. Has told you Caesar was ambitious. Now, that was the flaw Caesar had, was glorious, yes. He had money, yes, and he was, you know, rightly honoured for that. But he was ambitious, and that was why he deserved death. Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. Then he says, if it were so, it was a grievous fault. So he agrees. Someone is ambitious to rule over the Romans. It is a grievous, a terrible, a criminal fault. But did you notice the subtle suggestion at the beginning of the sentence? If it were so. Now, he could argue he's just making a throwaway remark. But what's he doing? He's sowing the seeds of doubt. Let's hold up Brutus' accusation of Caesar's ambition and see if it were so. And it says, grievously hath he answered for it. So, ambition would be a criminal, grievous, terrible fault. And grievously awfully has Caesar answered it. In other words, Caesar has answered his ambition by giving his life. So it's grievous, isn't it? It's terrible. It's deathly. He has paid with his life. 
Then, Mark Antony just establishes his right to speak. Look how it, this is very important in, in oration and, uh, and rhetoric. It's called ethos, establishing your, your value, your credit for the reason you can speak. He says here, hear under leave of Brutus and the rest. For Brutus is an honourable man. So are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. Right. So he says, I'm speaking here not because I'm biased towards Caesar, because you all know I loved him. I'm here under leave of Brutus and the rest, the senators. They have said I can speak at Caesar's funeral. But did you notice the phrase he then used? For Brutus is an honourable man. Oh, if Brutus lets me speak, this is honourable, okay? You can't disagree with it. So are they all, all honourable men. But he's going to play on that phrase about ambition and that Brutus is an honourable man. And remember, we had this rhetorical device we, we talked about, Repotia. This is going to come into play now as you see the phrase honourable man begin to change quite a lot. Now, we've got to this bit where he says, I come to speak at his funeral, in his funeral. Imagine there is now a pause because now he's explained why he's here. He's explained that Caesar is recognised to have done bad things. It's hinted that if it were so, he should have paid with his life. Now he's about to speak from his heart. I'm allowed to speak at Caesar's funeral. Brutus has said so. Look what he says next. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. Just pause there. Mark Antony says, I'm going to speak about Caesar. Forget all the accusations. What I can tell you is he was my friend, and he was faithful and just. That's two very good qualities that he's just pointed out in Caesar. He was faithful and just to me. You see, he takes away, he was faithful and just to you all, because, of course, the crowd would react and say, he's trying to defend Caesar. Caesar was a dictator. Brutus has said so. No, he just says, he's faithful and just to me. So Caesar's not all bad. But did you notice what he then said? But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. We've already heard these phrases already. So Caesar was good to me, but Brutus says he was ambitious. And he's making Brutus and Caesar what's called a foil for each other. He's putting Caesar against Brutus. And, and what will happen is, who is the good and who is the bad? Brutus says he was ambitious and Brutus is honourable. Watch how that changes. Talking back now about Caesar... Antony says, he hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Now, he's bringing in some thoughts for the crowd to think about. Something that Julius Caesar had done. He hath brought many captives home to Rome. So. We know that Julius Caesar was a general, he had his own legion, and he fought various places, notably Gaul. Well, you see, generals would bring captives, I mean, by the thousands, home to Rome. And some of those top captives, they were sold as slaves. In fact, all of them were sold as slaves. Some of the high-ranking ones were sold for a ransom. And that money came into Rome, and that money that was in Rome was then spent on the populace upon games, upon parks, upon giving the bread every day for free for the plebeians. And he's saying, Caesar brought many captives home and he filled up money for you, to pay for you. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? Because surely ambition is a grasping, selfish thing, is it not? And he's saying, but this is not selfish. This is not, is this ambitious? Then he moves on, did you see? He says, when that the poor have cried. So when the poor have been troubled and cried and been oppressed and hurt. 
So Caesar hath wept. So Caesar feels for you. He acts for you. Now, a study of the actual history of Julius Caesar, he was very much the populist's man. The commoner loved him. And that was one of the reasons the Senate did not want him in Rome, because the people loved him so much, he could make himself a dictator. It's what they feared. So when Brutus says, when the poor have cried, Caesar has wept, he's not kidding. Julius Caesar, even if he was faking it, did act in the public's interest. He did try to feel and emote with the common man. And if Caesar cried, do you see what Antony says next? Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. If he was ambitious, and only in, in it for himself, an ambitious, proud, powerful dictator doesn't weep, especially not over poor people. So if ambition doesn't weep, what's that saying about Julius Caesar, that he's not ambitious? If ambition is selfish and Julius Caesar brought many captives to make money for the Roman commoner, is he really ambitious? Now, what does he say straight after this? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. Do you notice he's saying the word honourable man slightly different now? It's this use of the same phrase, Brutus is an honourable man, <laughs> Brutus is an honourable man, but he's changing the stress, and it's now beginning to make us doubt whether Brutus is truly honourable. It's clever, isn't it? Now he makes another comment. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? So the Lupercal, um, it's a festival. Um, and there's an area, a cave, sort of at the foot of the Roman hills, um, where legend had it Romulus and Remus, the two brothers who founded Rome, um, was raised by the she-wolf. That was called the Lupercal. And they had a festival there. Now, during that festival, he's saying, you, all you people here, you saw me offer Caesar a crown to be the king three times at the festival. We offered him to be a king. And he said, no, three times. Thrice did he refuse. Thrice, three. Was this ambitious? Was this ambition? If Caesar wanted to be a king, he was offered the chance and he turned it down. You can't call that ambitious, can you? Of course, it was a publicity stunt. And a long level of thought might have let them think, yeah, he could have done that as a bit of a, a gimmick. But Mark Antony doesn't wait. He puts that thought in their mind. He turned down a crown three times. Is that ambitious? He moves on now. And what does he say next? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious and sure he is an honourable man. Methinks Brutus is not an honourable man going by this. Do you see that beautiful repetition all the time? Okay, he's placing Brutus as the foil for Caesar. Brutus says he is ambitious and Brutus is an honourable man. Caesar is ambitious. Caesar is not an honourable man. And yet he's stacking up these evidences of Caesar doing good. Now, he lays the table for two further speeches that he will make in the same scene. And that's the one thing to remember about this particular speech we're, re we're reading now, is it's actually only part one of a three-part speech. We're only going to deal with part one. I will do part two and three at a later point in a video. But he, here he's just laying the table for the crowd to think, actually, Brutus' argument is wrong. Caesar was not ambitious. They've killed him out of envy. Here he says, But here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? So, after actually undermining Brutus, what does Antony do? He says, I'm not here to speak against Brutus because he's constantly saying he's an honourable man. I'm just here really to speak what I know, which is a bit of a lie because he is clearly trying to win people over. 
but that's the effect he's having. I'm just here to speak what I know. You all did love him once. So the people of Rome loved Julius Caesar. And that's true. He then says, not without cause. He doesn't list, it's clever that he does this, it's an understatement. He doesn't list all the reasons. Rather, he lets that grow in their own mind. Not without cause. There were reasons that you loved Caesar. But then he juxtaposes the same word cause with itself. Because do you see the next line? When he says, you loved him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? So if it wasn't without cause that you loved him, what on earth is the cause that's holding you back from mourning him? Actually, they had just said, let's make Brutus Caesar. Let's make Brutus the next king. Um, and Caesar's a terrible person. Now Antony's saying, hang on, you loved him. And there was reason for that. So what actual reason is there for you not to grieve for Caesar? Now, Mark Antony, as we'll see, performs a bit of an emotional stunt. Okay, a ploy on the stage before everybody, um, whipping up emotion. He exclaims, O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. So what does he mean here? Judgment, people's ability to perceive right from wrong, has fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. So, oh, judgment, as if it's a personified quality, as if it's a God that imbues people with reason, saying you have fled to the beasts of the field. Because the people here, he's chastising the crowd. The people here are no better than animals. They can't think. They followed Brutus's advice that Caesar was ambitious and he should have been killed. So that's what he's saying. Men have lost their reason. You can't think. But as ever with Shakespeare, it's made more powerful subliminally by the fact that there's a double meaning here. Judgment can mean reason, but judgment can also be the one who rules and passes judgment on the populace. Previously, Caesar held the power of judgment. And now he's saying, O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts. Now, this is interesting. Brutish means brute or beast. So we could re-render that beastish beasts. Well, that's a redundant phrase, and Shakespeare wouldn't do that by accident. Uh, he's supposed to avoid redundancy. Why would he risk a redundant phrase, brutish beasts? What does brutish sound like? Who's he been talking about compared to Caesar? Brutus. Judgment, power. You have fled to brutish, brutus, beasts. Brutus and his co-conspirators are the beasts and now they hold power instead of Caesar. They are ambitious. They killed from envy. And men have lost their reason. You lot have let them take power. And then he steps back and imagine he turns away from the crowd and he says, bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. So by chastising them and saying men have lost their reason, people could be a little bit affronted but he, he acts, my emotions have got the better of me, bear with me, I'm sorry. It's great, it's almost like when a, um, someone in a court makes a statement and the opposition says object and the, the judge says overruled, the, the jury is supposed to ignore that comment, but because they're human, did they ever ignore it? It's gone in already. And that's what Anton is doing here. He said, judgment has fled to brutish men, men a brutish beast. Men have lost their reason. You've lost your ability to think. And then he's saying, I'm sorry. He's not sorry. He's put the thought in their mind that they've misunderstood and that they've been led along by Brutus. And he's saying, bear with me. The reason I snapped like that is because my heart, or the emotion, is in the coffin there with Caesar. Caesar's heart, which once beat greatly, is in that coffin and my heart is with him. And he says, I have to pause and wait for it to come back to me. In other words, 
I'm, I'm overwhelmed by emotion a minute and I'm not going to be able to speak until I get myself back together, until I get my heart strength. And it's a, it's a great bit of performance that Anthony is doing. He's really thrumming on the strings of people's emotions. And the thing is, it works. And it eventually leads to the downfall of all of the senators and Brutus. And that's the most tragic thing, but that's for another video. So, I hope you enjoyed that explanation, just so that it makes a bit more sense. And I will probably try and do this, another video on this, where I read the speech in three different ways, so that you can really toss it around and get um, a real understanding of what could be said and how it can be interpreted. But I think it's always good at the end of discussing it just to read the speech once through and see if you can follow it now just as we read. Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus hath told you Caesar was ambitious. If it was so, it was a grievous fault, and grievously hath Caesar answered it. Here, under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honourable man, so are they all, all honourable men, come I to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. But Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. He hath brought many captives home to Rome, whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Did this in Caesar seem ambitious? When that the poor have cried, Caesar hath wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and Brutus is an honourable man. You all did see that on the Lupercal I thrice presented him a kingly crown, which he did thrice refuse. Was this ambition? Yet Brutus says he was ambitious, and sure he is an honourable man. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but here I am to speak what I do know. You all did love him once, not without cause. What cause withholds you then to mourn for him? O oh, judgment, thou art fled to brutish beasts, and men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar and I must pause till it come back to me. So that was a neutral reading. Um, so you can put the interpretation on it there. I hope you really enjoyed this video. And uh, if you did, please, please, and you want to learn more about Shakespeare and about classic literature and improve your understanding, then please like and subscribe to my channel because I'll be doing a lot more videos to do with Shakespeare and book reviews on the classic literature, predominantly of the 19th century.